Good morning. morning. Well, it's summertime, and everybody's camping and traveling and doing these crazy things like getting married, and it's okay. That's what summer's for. Just don't go camping or get married in the wintertime, I guess. Hey, uh, you know why these people from New York City are so uh, grumpy? Because the light at the end of the tunnel for them is New Jersey. I'd be grumpy too. Oh, Connie says no. (laughs) Well, you know what? We have light at the end of the tunnel, and it's not New Jersey. It's the Lord. And so we're going to just thank him for this day, and then we will listen and join in some worship music. Father in heaven, you have spun this world out like a yo-yo, and it's on its way back. We, are, we don't know where we are. We may be still going or we may be coming back, but either way, we will arrive in your hands safely. And uh, just to be a passenger on the planet, just to share in this extraordinary experience of living is an amazing adventure to us. Let us not be so busy, even in the wonders and taking in all of the thrills and the wonders that we overlook and forget about the one whose hand Spun the yo-yo out. The one who owns and creates and puts it all in order and all in place and has a purpose. We come here because we don't want to forget. We want to remind ourselves continually of who we are and whose we are. We thank you for this moment, this place, this opportunity today to worship you. As you prayed and as you, spoke, as, as you taught with the lady, let this be a moment when our worship is in spirit and in truth. That we're, so that we're not just here out of habit, even though there's nothing wrong with having a habit. But we're here, each of us as individuals, not even dependent on each other, not even as connected as a family. We're here as individuals before you. 
to bow on our knees, to bow in our hearts, to bow our head, to thank you for the awesome privilege of living and of being made in your image. We worship you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning. If you would stand, we're going to open this in worship here and uh, just set our thoughts and minds towards uh, our Holy Communion. Thank you. 
can be seated. Thank you, ladies. We have here this morning these uh, elements, these symbols, this table. We call it Holy Communion. We call it the Lord's Table. We call it the Eucharist. We call it many different things. Um, 
but this is for us, and you are invited to come. You know, since we've quit passing through the pews because of COVID, we ask you to come here. That's a problem or an issue, and you cannot walk or come up here, literally. Uh, if you will just let me know, I'll be glad to bring the symbols out to you. Our policy is open, which means that you do not need to be a member of our church. If you have received Christ as your own Savior, and you know the Holy Spirit bears witness to you that you are a child of God, you are uh, one of His followers, then we invite you to come, and we hope that you will come. You know, I was thinking this morning uh, how it is that around the world, in the many different Christian communities and denominations and groups, there's differences of understanding as to what this means. What, not of what these symbols represent, the bread and the body and the cup and the blood. This is clear from Jesus himself. But there's many different slants on that. And, you know, the Catholics, for example, take this very literally. And there's a, a, a doctrine called transubstantiation that is very near and dear to the hearts of Catholics. The Protestants take this symbolically. We say, well, we don't believe that the element transubstantiates or changes its substance. We believe that it symbolizes and that the language of Jesus was, symbol, was symbolic. Some people say, I don't know what to believe about all this. I want to remind us of something before we came, before we come. I want to remind us of something. Jesus didn't say that day when he instituted this with his 12 disciples and he took the bread and he broke it. He didn't say, take it and understand everything. He said, take it and eat. Sometimes faith is what God values above even fully understanding or comprehending. So if you have one understanding or one perspective and you have a friend or even a husband or wife or someone who has a little different perspective, I just want to remind us of that. Jesus said, take and eat. This is my body. That is broken for you. Would you join me for a moment of prayer? And then we just invite you to come. And as you know, uh, what I'm going to ask you to do is come out of your pews and come up the center aisle. And then you can fan out this way and go back. So that it just keeps kind of traffic flow and confusion to a minimum. And, uh, and the, uh, there's trash cans up here. So that when you take the little cup, it has a piece of bread in it. And the communion cup, you can... As you walk out. And, and, and also I want to say this. Take your time. Don't let the fact that there's other people waiting. Don't let that disturb you. Unfortunately this is kind of the best compromise we know about how to do it right now. And I know that there's a little bit of a balance between feeling like well there's people behind me waiting. But this is a moment that is important and special to me. And I don't want to just slam my way through it. Understand that. And I'm simply saying. If we have to spend the rest of the morning here, that's what we'll do. Take your time and receive these symbols. Heavenly Father, this is a, a time where we celebrate your lamb, your, your sacrifice. This is a moment and a symbol that has nothing to do with a particular group or denomination or perspective. Because you just said, take it and eat it. This is for the forgiveness of your sins. This is a new covenant in my blood. And so as your children today, we do that. But we also pray that somehow you will renew our soul, that it will not be something that we do simply by habit or remote control. But as we do this, that you will touch our bodies, our hearts, our minds, our souls, renew us, renew our faith, forgive our sins. So that, uh, that this time and this symbol will somehow give us a different take on this whole week and on our, the rest of our life. I thank you that we have this table to come and eat your body and your blood. Amen. As the music comes, just feel free to come to the Lord's table. Amen. 
We're going to stand together uh, in your hymnal. I believe it's page 403. There's actually a reading. And then the next page, it kind of leads into a song. So we're going to read that reading uh, al- alternately, back and forth. By the way, while we stand, any of you children who'd like to go downstairs to your children's church, you are dismissed to go. And uh, we're going to We're going to read this. I don't know what happened. They stood in the back and they didn't stand here. <laughs> I've never seen that before. <laughs> That's a good one. You're, you're my favorites back here. <laughs> hey, let's read this together, the, the, this, uh, these scriptures, and uh, then we will sing. My hope is built. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also... We have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exalt in the hope of the glory of God, and hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given to us. In the same way, God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath in order that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we may have strong encouragement, we who have fled for refuge in laying hold of the hope set before us.
Tell them good morning before you sit down. Give them a greeting. Okay, it's one thing to be friendly, but this is ridiculous. <laughs> hey, we got a note. I just wanted to mention this uh, from our friend Chanel, who is in prison and will be in prison the rest of her life. She wrote a note, uh, and I'll put it on the bulletin board, just as thanking those of you who sent her birthday greetings. I think a couple weeks ago was her birthday, so I just wanted to tell you that. Also, I want to mention that uh, we have a group heading to Holly Hills, Florida this week. Some adults, or some, some teenagers, some adults who aren't much better. I mean, I mean, who aren't much further along. And uh, then I think there are actually some mature adults as well that are going. Anyway, I'm just kidding. But uh, they will be pulling out here in the middle of the night tonight. And uh, I did want to take a moment and pray for them. If you're going to Florida with this group, would you stand for a moment? I'd just like to pray for you. We're even going to pray that you will come back. <laughs> that you will get there, but that you will come back up in the balconies, Tim. And you're coming back, Josh, when? Saturday? Friday? Saturday. If the adults have their way, they're coming back Saturday. If the teenagers have their way, who knows? Can we just pray for them for a second? Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for the opportunity of, these, of this group to go. We pray that you will go with them, that you will strengthen and guide them, that you will enable each part of their uh, plan to fall into place and to work. But most importantly, that you will enable them to connect with individuals and, and circumstances there that they feel when they do come to return that it was worthwhile and that this was a, an experience that you directed and that you helped them with. We pray that you'll give them safety, that you will help their families not to worry, and that you will guide and provide for them all along the way and return them back again strengthened and even more excited about what they, what they have seen even throughout this week in your, your work alive in their lives. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> well, you know, we're, we've been looking at uh, these different questions that people ask. And this question, really, uh, this question... Okay, my monitor isn't on here, so I apologize. I didn't know if I had a slide up here. This question is really an important question. And so just listen to it. It's kind of long. Somebody said, how important is unity within the church? Considering current trends calling on the church to tolerate woke, homosexuality, degeneration, women preachers, no judgment of sin because it may offend someone. Is the church to unify or disunify? That's the question. Is, what are we supposed to do here? we got all these different voices saying, well, the church should be here, the church should be there, the church should respond to the culture, but the culture has all this craziness. And then it says, um, and what is the future of churches that do not hold to biblical doctrine? So, uh, of course, I'm going to answer all of those in each part of them in, in 15 minutes. No. Uh, but it's a great question because it's just not a question saying, well, should we have unity? The question is, how important is it that we should have unity? We know we all want to be unified. Jesus knelt down on his knees and prayed in the garden, and he said, Holy Father, let them be one as I and you are one. So we know that unity is something we should 
have or seek or strive for, but at what point do you say uh, there's something more important than unity? Or do you ever reach that point? I guess that's the question that is, is being asked. Um, so I'm going to read or use, talk about briefly a passage in 1 Corinthians 1, a passage in 1 Corinthians 3, a passage in 1 Corinthians 5 to mention three different aspects. The first one in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians in the New Testament talks about, actually is a plead, a pleading or a prayer for unity and it's saying it is extremely important that those believers in a local church such as us or between church groups such as the Mennonites and the Baptists and Methodists and us and all these different groups, Catholics and Protestants and, and all these things, uh, whether between those groups, it is, a, it is extremely important that we seek every bit of common ground that we can possibly find. In fact, he goes so far here in this passage to say, I plead with you, I beg you. That's pretty strong language. If I can read uh, there in verse 10. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another, so that there can be no divisions among you, that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers, some from close household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. Can you believe that? What I mean is, one of you says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apollos. Another says, I follow Cephas. And another, I follow Christ. And he says, is Christ divided? Come on. Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? That's enough for now to answer the question. Uh, of course, people are going to have different perspectives. Of course, we're going to have different ideas and all that um, and discussion and disagreement is part of life. But Paul is saying, listen, in all of your differences of opinion, you should be humble enough to have an attitude that seeks to agree, if possible, that seeks to uh, do whatever you can to come together. And, and he mentions these four things. I have them written there in your sermon notes. He says, agree. I plead with you to agree with each other. What in a world does that mean? I mean, why would he be so, what is his interest? Well, his interest is that, let's just say our group here, this particular church, that we would take the time, the thoughtfulness, the prayerfulness to, if we have a problem or disagreement or we have a fuss or a quarrel or whatever, to, um, to call each other up and to say, can we sit down and have a sandwich or something and, and see if we can get on the same page to put some effort into it. To see whether it's possible we can agree. Maybe we, in, in the end, maybe we can agree. I always say I'm glad everybody in the world don't agree with me. Otherwise, they'd all want to marry my wife. <laughs> it's good to have variety. It's a good thing to see from different points of view. But it's also an amazingly good thing to get on the same page and pull from the same perspective and agree with each other. So he says, seek to agree with each other if, if that's possible. I suppose the fact that there are many different groups or divisions within the Christian fold, I suppose means that in the final analysis, we haven't always been able to, to agree. So the Presbyterians have their point of view and, and, and the... Lutherans have their point of view, and the Catholics, and the um, Quakers, and, you know, in the final analysis, in the Christian faith, I suppose the only point of full agreement across the spectrum is this narrow, very, very narrow, very fundamental, very obvious, undeniable band of information, uh, like, for example, in the Apostles' Creed, that all the church came together, all the churches from across Europe and Asia in, three, in the fourth century and said, well, we got to agree here in the best we can. What can we agree on? I believe in God the Father Almighty. Man, we ought to all be able to agree with that. 
And in Jesus Christ, his son, our only, his, his son, our only, his only son, our Savior and Lord. We all ought to be able to agree with that. And so the Apostles' Creed just lays out the most fundamental basics. I believe in the resurrection. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the communion of the saints, fellowship of the church, life everlasting. You get past that, and some people say, "Eh, I don't know if I can agree with that. But Paul says here, it's important enough to try that you make every effort to try to persuade somebody. Well, look at it from my point of view. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm going to pray that we can come to one mind. I'm going to, cr- I'm going to pray that, that, that somehow we'll be able to understand the perspective we have. It's that important for us in the body of Christ to be unified. <clears throat> I, I need helpers. How about Steve? Caleb, you're available. Can you come up here a second? Just stand one on my right, one on my left here. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to. I'm. I'm not going to abuse you. I'm not even going to. I'm not going to pay you anything either. So, <laughs> sorry. So, this is my friend Caleb, and Caleb and I are very compatible with each other. By the way, I'm making all this up, right? <laughs> we are not compatible. Okay. Caleb and I are very compatible. We're friends and neighbors, and we share so much in common. I mean, if I say the, the Orioles, he says, yes, sir. Hush up. Don't say anything. <laughs> if, you know, if I say Ford, he says, absolutely. We just get along. We just click with each other, and we are very unified. We're friends. We're compatible. We have, we have many, many things in common which is why we are good friends. Except for one thing we do not share. He doesn't believe in God. On the spiritual level, we are not unified. On the spiritual level, there is a difference. In spite of my faith, he does not share it. We share almost many other things in life and and we have in common. And we're good friends, but he is not a Christian. He does not believe. Okay, now over here, Steve. <laughs> you can already tell, Steve and me, <laughs> he's a grouch. <laughs> we don't agree on anything. I mean, he's my neighbor. Caleb's my neighbor over on this side. Steve's my neighbor over here. And Steve and I, I mean, we tolerate each other, but that's just about all I can say. He's a, he's a grouchy guy. What can I, what can I say? We don't agree on anything. I mean, if I say Ford, he says Chevrolet. If I say Orioles, he says Yankees. Whatever. Like, we just, we, we kind of are in different universes, Steve and I. In fact, however, on a spiritual level, even though I'm a Protestant and he's a Catholic, we do share a common faith. He actually believes these things in the Apostles' Creed, for example. He actually believes that the Scriptures are the Word of God, even though his perspectives on some things are different, and and his perspective on communion, for example, is different. He actually believes. We don't share... we, We are like in different universes, and it's hard for us even to be... to get along as neighbors. We're not real compatible... But in this one issue, he and I agree and are unified because we both are Christians. Over here, it's very easy to like this guy and get along with him. However, in this one area, just in this one area, this is what Scripture calls light and darkness. So I ask you, uh, of these two neighbors, who do I have the most in common with? Who do I need to uh, seek to be unified with? This is my answer. That all of the things I have in agreement with him, all of them, are not as important as this one thing that I have in agreement with him. The importance of this one issue, the spiritual side, overrides 
all of the negative things that I'm not easily unified with so that I, so that I must seek unity with Him. The irrelevance of all this cultural stuff does not replace the importance of this one spiritual area. That this guy is lost. He and I are in different pages and places and perspectives in life. And even though I like him very much and I get along with him great, there is a, there's a, there's a, a line that I cannot, I'm not able to cross in being unified with him. Hey, you can go sit down. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'll pay you later. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? There is, there is the spiritual side of life that's, that's most important of all. And if we share that, even though we don't agree about all the details, we should keep working and attempting to find the areas that we can agree because this unity is important. Um, he, says, have, uh, he says, be perfect, let there be no divisions, be perfectly united in heart and mind. So this is how important unity is. It is extremely important. However, and I'm going to jump to chapter 3 in 1 Corinthians. Right after he's telling them how terrible it is that they're quarreling over leaders in this particular church. And this is a letter to a local church. This is a, a letter that he wrote to one group of people in the, in the uh, city in southern Greece called Corinth. Even though it's a, it's, a, it's a letter written to just a local group of people, even though he was just telling them how important and essential it is for them to, to seek to be unified, when it comes to chapter 3, he kind of quits being nice. Paul does. And he says, listen, this silly quarreling has gone on long enough. You are caught up in personality. And so one of you are, are you, you know, uh, following Peter and one Paul and Apollos, and these are leaders. And Paul doesn't take sides with any of them. In fact, he doesn't take side with his own fan club at all. In fact, here's what he says in verse, uh, in verse 1, chapter 3. Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk. Not solid food, because you were not ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? By that he means non-believing people. For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Paulus, are you not men? What, after all, is Paul or Apollos? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each one his task. And then if you jump down to verse 21, look what he says. So then, stop it. No more boasting about men. So now he's getting down to brass tacks. After saying, oh, I plead with you, get along Work together, pray together, spend time working, really trying to be in agreement and harmony with each other. If you have a board meeting or you have a, a church project and you, one guy wants to put this on, kind of roof on, another guy puts this kind of roof on, another guy says, forget the roof. We don't even... Keep working, keep talking, have a debate, but then just continue to stress that you are, are unified. However, after saying that, he turns right around and says, um, there, is a, there, there is a limit. And he says, uh, you need to, you've argued, you've discussed, now you need to stop it. And this is now something that's actually becoming an area of theology or an area of believing. One of them says, well, I believe that the true heir to the throne of God or that the true leader of God or the true Messiah in the world is Jesus. And another says, no, I think it's Peter. I think it's Paul. And so you have these things that are becoming now doctrinal issues. And they're starting to fragment people and cause people to be... Uh, to put each other down. 
And he says, you're acting like non-believers who don't even have the Holy Spirit within you to give you this sense of the sense of humility. And so there's a limit to which unity as a theme and as a desire can go. You know, I think of the line in Fiddler on the Roof where old Tevye, the milkman, has a daughter named um, Havala. She wants to marry a Russian who is not a Christian. This was a setting in a, a, a Jewish village in in Russia in 1920s. And his daughters, one by one, step a little farther away from the Jewish fold and the traditions of their family. And when it comes to this third daughter, who the first one wanted to marry outside the, the, the clan, then the next one, and the, by the third one, she, the guy she wants to marry is, a, is an atheist. He's a reg, regular Russian militant. And she, he won't give his permission. And as many of you parents can relate to this because your, your kid wants to go down some kind of a path that you're not at all comfortable with, but they want your blessing. And the daughter says to Tevye, Father, you have to bend. And Tevye says, if I bend that far, I will break. And it's such a great statement of the classic dilemma of how far can you stretch to maintain unity before you don't even stand for anything. You've moved your position, so what is there to be unified about because you've been pulled completely sideways? And I think that's what this question is saying. What about all these cultural things that are saying, hey, the church better wake up and get into 21st century. And if, they're, you know, if they were the church of Christ and they were the loving people of God, they would be accepting all this stuff uh, that the Bible says we shouldn't accept and we, we should uh, uh, not be at peace with and not be comfortable with. So I'm saying to you that from, from this perspective about Paul and Apollos, that unity is important and we should work for it and pray for it. However, it's not so important that we should ignore error just because we don't want to challenge a culture. Just because we don't want to stand up and say, that I will never accept, that I will never go along with, that is an immoral, wrongful uh, action, and I will never go along with it. Maybe I can't stop it, but I will never accept it. And, 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 and he says there's a line in, her, her, uh, in which a different opinion becomes a heresy. It becomes an error. And this theologically was one of them. So it seems to me what I'm trying to say is God values unity, but he doesn't value unity above truth. Here's a verse in 2 Corinthians 13. This is Paul he says, I cannot do anything against the truth. Sure, I want to be popular. Sure, I'd like to have unity. I'd like to get along with everybody. But guess what? There's this little matter called the truth. And I cannot do anything against the truth. I, I, I want to I say something about that. We often do not speak truth because we fear that we will destroy unity. And so we're in a meeting or we're in a group of, of church congregation or whatever. And we'd like to say something or we want to say something. We feel we should say something. Sometimes we feel that the Holy Spirit is impressing upon us to say something, but we don't. Because we think, oh, it'll make somebody mad. That'll hurt some, that'll, that'll destroy some kind of unity. This is what I have found. If you speak your truth with humility and love and sincerity, many times it will not destroy the unity. Not always. There are times where unity will only stretch so far, as I said, and then it breaks. But often our fears to sp about speaking up because we will offend somebody or we will uh, destroy unity is more a result of our attitude than it is actually of the truth. Not always, but, but often. 
So, <clears throat> unity is important, but not important enough that we don't stop and say, whoa, hold it, hang on, that is wrong. You are in error. At that point, unity doesn't matter as much as truth. That's my point. Here's a second one. This is from um, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Not just theological truth or mental truth, but now I'm talking about actions that are flat out immoral or evil. And yet the people perpetrating these actions are people within the church family or people within the Christian community. People who say on the right, on the one hand, yes, I'll come and I'll receive communion. I'm part of the body of Christ. But we'll turn right around and do something that absolutely contradicts that statement. In 1 Corinthians 5, the, the, uh, I'm not going to take time to read it, but the issue there is an immoral sexual relationship. And Paul is appalled when he hears about this. Uh, this involves a man in that particular local church. And this man was involved with his, his, he says, his father's wife. And Paul says, you know, that's a line that even unbelievers don't step across. You don't even hear about this, he says, in the pagan world. So in other words, here you have someone professing to follow Christ. At the same time, more pagan than the pagans, is his point. And he says, this cannot be ignored. And he even says to those people there in Corinth, sometime when you're gathered together and the power of the Lord is present among you, hand this dude over to Satan so that his, so that his uh, body can be destroyed, but his spirit can be preserved at the day of Christ. That's a tough thing to understand. What is he talking about? How do we hand somebody over to Satan and all that? What does it mean? I'm not going to get into it all. I don't even know. But, uh, but my point is that Paul says here is something that cannot be ignored even for the sake of unity. We all want unity, but it's not so important that you sell your soul. It's not so important that you ignore an immoral or evil situation as if somehow uh, it doesn't matter so, if they go back to my little formula, God does not devalue unity above truth. I would say it this way, God does not value unity above righteousness. Just in other words, God cares more about what you think and believe, even than whether you get along with everybody. He also cares more about how you act and live, even than whether you're able to get along with everybody. This is, this is important. Here's what he says in 1 Timothy Pursue righteousness. This is, God's, this is God's concern, God's desire. Maybe I could kind of summarize this with saying it like this. This is not, this is not rocket science. This is nothing new, I understand. But the desire for unity must cause us to try to accept differences in our method. That's what I said in point number one. You know, when these ladies came up here and sang this morning and led us in some worship music, and they were very gentle and very mild and, and, and so forth, I know that some, some of us prefer different kind of music. And even, even this soft-spoken uh, Type, and I'm not talking about drums and lights and smoke going around. I'm just saying some of us have a very narrow band of music preference. And we say, this is what I like. I don't like anything else. You, I, don't want it, I don't even want any of it. I just, I just want to do it this way. I'm simply saying that even though that may be true, the first part says, that's just a method. Get over it. Keep working with it. Try to adapt. Try to adjust. Because it's an external thing. The music is the internal thing. The message is what is important more than the method. And so what I'm seeing here in the Bible is that the Lord's saying, strive and strive and plead and pray towards unity in, uh, in what you can, if possible, 
uh, in, in the message. But don't worry so much. But, but if the message is threatened by the differences of method, then you need to stand up and you say, I'm sorry, I cannot go along with that. I'm sorry, I won't be part of this. Because now we're not just trying a new method. Now we're actually changing the message. That's what got Paul so upset. He said, is Christ divided? Did Peter die for you? Did, you know, did, did Apollos go to the cross? I don't think so. You're changing the message here because you're getting caught up in, in the differences of, of, the, of the method. Que- the question asked about churches that don't that, that just say, we want to be unified. We want to be unified with everybody. We want to be unified with the politicians. We want to be unified with the community. And so we open, for example, I, I just read recently or saw recently somewhere there was some kind of a gay pride uh, parade or something, and it was headquartered in a church. It was, uh, I think it was in Boston or somewhere. It was uh, using the church facilities as their as their headquarters for this event uh, that, to celebrate homosexuality. I'm simply saying, as this uh, question is asked here, what about these type of churches? Um, I think they're irrelevant. I think in the book of Revelation, when the Lord comes to these different churches, and one of them, for example, he says, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth because uh, you're more concerned about being friendly to the world than you are being true to me. And I will... I will punish you. And there are a number of those messages there. Um, so, uh, here's a verse that just says in, you know, in our day and in our time, there will be many such groups where the concern for unity and popularity and acceptance will outweigh their desire for the truth and their love of, the, of God. And so he says, they will, they will teach whatever culture wants to hear. And we know that this, this happens and this goes on. They will turn, or it goes on now. They will turn from truth and they will turn aside to myths. We see this. What's going to happen to them, is, to groups like this? I personally think that they, they're not used of God now, even though they may be very popular, well-known groups within the culture. Here's a verse that, before I close, I, wanna, I, I want you to read and to think about. You know, the heart of it is this word in bold, the faith of the gospel. That's the message. But he says, you need to have one spirit and to stand together even though you may be hundreds or thousands in your group, stand together as if you're one person. Contend as if you're one man, he says, for the faith. And part of the reason is this. The dangers that we face are more... Are, are, the dangers that we face are many. We live in a culture today as this person wrote with their question where there's all these kind of issues that the church are being called to accept and adapt and say, ah, oh, you don't need to, you need to change uh, some of your standards. I heard a, a pastor on TV, uh, this was a, two or three years ago, I made a statement I'll never forget. He said, the Bible needs to be dragged kicking and screaming into the 21st century. He was advocating the changing of the Ten Commandments, letting down some of these moral standards and so forth. Uh, pastor of a large church. And, uh, and so, these things that we face in our culture are quite dangerous. In the face of them, we have to realize that the differences that we have aren't so important. I mean, just illustrate. I know it's time to go, to go but let me tell you a quick, quick story. This was a number of years ago. I was helping this dude out. I always get in trouble when I'm trying to help somebody. It's inevitable. Oh, this guy had a tree that he needed help cut with. It was an ash tree. It was about 12 inches or 15 inches in diameter. The problem was he had a big, wide, spacious yard. The problem was the tree was sitting right out of the road. I said, that's no problem, man. I'll help you. 
And so I'm out here, I'm sawing away at this tree, and just, you know what's going to happen. Just at the point where the thing was ready to go, out of absolute nowhere came a blast of wind. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right across the road, this tree goes, and in the process, a limb catches an electric wire, (laughs) yanks it right down, and so now you got this live wire laying on the road, wrapped up in the tree, and I mean, it got real interesting real quick. Here's the funny part. It, it knocked power out to a couple of local houses. Instantly, I had visitors. <laughs> and this one guy comes running out of the house over here. I kid you not. He's got cowboy boots, cowboy hat. He looked like he just got home from a rodeo. And he comes out, and he's, he's yelling and asking questions. And over here comes a guy tripping up, and he's got a tennis shoes and shorts and a t-shirt on and while I'm trying to tell these guys um, if we're trying to figure out you know what to do here this car pulls up and this lady jumps out and she's got on a nightgown and and rollers in her hair curlers in her hair and she's flapping her arms up and down and she's all excited and I mean it, it was really funny I, this one the one dude with the cowboy hat he's saying I think we should I think we should rip the stop sign off at the corner, at the corner and bring it out here and put it up here in the road so people know to stop. I said, I told him, I said, it's broad daylight. There's a tree laying across the road. And you got a lady in a nightgown standing out here going like this. I think people will stop. I don't think that'll be a problem. All kinds of, all kinds of advice. And it was, it was a pretty, uh, it, it was pretty crazy. Oh, somebody was saying, you know, call the fire department. Call the electric, call 911, and all these sort of, while they're discussing these options, I just got a piece of wood and went out there and dragged this thing out of it. But it's a picture to me. All these people, so wildly different in that moment. This lady in her nightgown, and, and this guy looked like he just stepped out of a rodeo showroom, and many differences. But we all faced a danger. We had a live wire. You know? And in that moment, it didn't matter if you had curlers in your hair or you were wearing cowboy boots. No, nobody cared. We all just had this common project. We had a little dangerous situation. We were a little concerned. We had to get it fixed. And uh, it's just an illustration. The differences we feel... For the most part, now, sometimes there are limits. When we get into doctrine or we get into moral behavior, we have to draw a line and we have to say, I'm sorry, if this is a test of unity, I cannot be unified with you here. You need to stop this if you want unity with me. That's what Paul was saying in these two situations. But the differences on many other circumstances that we feel, even though they are real, they're not as important as this live wire, as this culture that's calling for us to give up Christ or quit believing or come down from the moral high ground of the Ten Commandments and just be like everybody else and just be nice and give people a place to come and and feel good about themselves on Sunday morning. But don't preach Christ and truth and resurrection. We don't buy any of of that stuff. We don't accept any of that stuff. Um, At that point, this is the danger to the message that we cannot give up even for the purpose or for the sake of being unified. Can we sing? It's quarter till. I'd like to sing uh, this little chorus that gives a statement of of promise it's uh number 253 this is the promise that if we as we seek unity if we invite the holy spirit into the conversation as i said earlier if we're sincere and we're humble and we're loving he'll give us peace and he will give us love and he'll help us to sort out So can we sing that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where the Spirit of the Lord is. Mm -hmm. Here we go. 
Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is peace. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is love. There is comfort in life's darkest hour. There is light and light. There is help and power in the Spirit, in the Spirit of the Lord. Heavenly Father, we pray you'll give us unity, that you will give us a great sense of camaraderie, of, camaraderie, of, uh, of patience with each other, of prayer, discussion, just seeking to be on the same page, that we want this, that we value this, that we treasure it. Give that to us, we pray. But we also ask that you will give to us your spirit so that we will understand and know when the method is beginning to change the message so that we need to put up our feet and skid to a halt and say, I can't go this far. With God as my helper, this is my conviction and this is where I stand. So that you can bless us in our conviction for truth even more than in our desire for unity. As we head into a world this week that uh, we don't know where, where it will lead us, we pray, Lord, that we can experience a week of great unity and joy with others. But that we also will feel that we... We see your truth and your righteousness at work in our own hearts, but also in the lives of others. Protect us, fill us, and bless us that we can bless others around us. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you, Steve.